All right. Well, I was hoping to get this one last sew off complete. Um, I did go through this uh, elk hide, as you saw, two layers of that, and this amazing uh, white uh, just got the job done so easy. Uh, this is again a, a Japanese-made model. It's uh, the white model 764 uh, and uh, 1.3 amps uh, is the power of this motor. So we're talking about really the strength of a Singer 201-2 times 2 plus one tenth of an amp. So uh, a Singer 201-2, the Rolls-Royce of Singer sewing machines, has a 0.6 amp motor. So you're looking at 0.6 times 2, which is 1.2, plus another tenth of an amp to equal the power of this Japanese white model 764. So all I can say is, if you're looking for a machine that has the power to get the job done, whether you're sewing leather, uh, canvas, biothane, doesn't matter. This machine will get the job done for you. So I'm going to zip down these uh, two layers of genuine cowhide and we'll see how she does with this as well. Here we go. And no, I'm not pedal to the metal. I've got it maybe about oh 25 percent of the way down maybe i'm not making it up folks 25 percent of the way down and look at the stitch quality just absolutely gorgeous lock stitch in every way on the bottom you can see that on the bottom the lock stitch is perfect uh just like the top stitch uh stitch quality on this japanese engineered white uh in my opinion is spectacular so those are two of the sew-offs we've done so far. I, I had had this extra piece as well, and I decided it was a little bit too narrow for me to fold it in half like I just did that other one, so I skipped this one. Uh, that was my plan. And the other thing I'll show you real quick before I forget to do it is this machine comes with two original uh, owner manuals as well. And I'm going to put these kind of side by side, and then we'll uh, cover a little bit of the white uh, sewing machine history kind of talk about that a little bit and I've obviously got to change my camera angle a little bit as well so the first manual on the right is the comprehensive owner's manual and you'll notice that they were really proud when this machine rolled out uh, because they were given a special recognition right here selected by the house of good taste New York's World's Fair now I would love to speak articulately about what good taste is. I'll just say that what they were implying is if you're looking for a machine that has what it takes and it's made well, it's going to be a good uh, piece to add to your home, then it's going to receive that accolade. Uh, and not a lot of accolades handed out at World's Fairs. You might remember another significant World's Fair that was based in Chicago that rolled out that very coveted little princess of singers, uh, the Singer 221, uh, the featherweight. So the World's Fairs back in the day, back in the 1950s, back in the 1960s, uh, and even prior to that, uh, because again the featherweight rolled out in the uh, early 1930s at the World's Fair in Chicago, uh, but the World's Fairs were just a wonderful venue to uh, present all the newest, greatest gadgets out there. And sewing machines were certainly in, lumped into that as well. So uh, just a, really an amazing uh, engineered machine, especially as I went through it. And we'll kind, of, we'll kind of sneak over there as well and look at some of those shots on Facebook in a little bit. But the first impression that I hope you get as you look at this is it's just a sexy machine. I mean... The Italians always were trying to make their machines more curvaceous, more sexy. Uh, just really wanted to make them stand out. Uh, Singer jumped into that a little bit with the 500 series uh, machines, the 503 Rocketeer and such. And they were just trying to make them real sexy and real curvaceous. Well, I mean, look at the lines in this machine. It just, it just speaks beauty. It just 
conveys uh, grace, it conveys uh, sensuality, and uh, it's just a, just a spectacular machine to look at, and an equally spectacular machine uh, when you get material underneath the needle. So the other smaller book you're going to see on the left side is kind of a quick reference, and not a lot of sewing makers back in the day gave you a quick reference book for some of those hot topics that you might want to go back to regularly without having to thumb through the entire owner's manual. And so another statement of uh, quality, or as they were given the uh, accolade for at the New York World's Fair, good taste. It's good taste to make it easy for a sewing machine owner to be able to find what they need so they can resume sewing. So again, uh, white uh, by way of their Japanese manufacturers really wanted to you know really wanted to bring that home the look of the machine the engineering of the machine the resources that came with the machine uh, they just wanted to make it as easy as possible for that sewing machine owner to get the job done and I didn't show it in the camera shot but I'm also going to be including the original uh, zigzag uh, canister that has all kinds of goodies uh, inside of it. I'm not going to pull everything out but I'll pop the lid and at least give you a glimpse into there. I mean we're talking original uh, and I can't see it on my screen turned around. Uh, original needles, um, extra bobbins, uh, what else do we have? Attachments, uh, screwdrivers, an extra uh, needle plate if you're wanting to just specifically use the machine as a straight stitcher. Uh, it has a separate needle plate that you can easily pop on just for that purpose because when you change out needle plates it's going to change how that material moves uh, and how you're able to sew. So, uh, you know, just a ton of attachments in here as well. Screwdrivers, every little doodad that you might potentially want uh, in this original uh, zigzag box that came with this white uh, model uh, six, excuse me, 764 <laughs> model 764 so let me just, let me move these really cool manuals to the side real quick again these are going to go with the machine and uh, just walk you around the machine real quick and also I've got to, I would be remiss if I didn't share a little doodad on the white uh, sewing machine company if I can get my cheat sheet to open here alright here we go so when you're looking at the white sewing machine and you're looking at nothing right now because I literally just moved that little box alright now you're looking at this really cool white model 7 64. Did I get it right? Yes, I did. <laughs> so, a little bit on vintage white machines and uh, a little bit about their founder. So, vintage white sewing machines are very common these days. You can find them all over the place. Uh, if you go to thrift shops, if you go to estate sales, uh, they've survived well because they were engineered and made so well. The same could be said of other brands, but whites are out there and they've been around for a long time. And uh, when it comes to their, uh, their origin, let's go to that first. In 1858, at the age of only 22 years of age, the founder of the company, Thomas White, started manufacturing New England type sewing machines which he sold for just 10 bucks a piece. The first machines were manufactured at the small Wilkinson machine shop in Templeton, Massachusetts. White and a business partner pulled together 350 bucks to start their company. Funds were so scarce that each machine made had to be sold before Mr. White could afford to manufacture another. Talk about bare bones budget. You know, how would you, how would you have loved if, if it was required back then to present a business plan and say, okay, what assets do you have? Well, we pretty much have nothing. We've got enough to make 
each machine and when we when we make each machine we got to sell it right away otherwise we're out of cash <laughs> oh my gosh uh, that would not fly so well with the financial institutions, to say the least, if you wanted to get a loan. Uh, so uh, then in 1866, sewing machine production was moved to Cleveland, Ohio. And in 1876, just about 10 years later, the White Sewing Machine Company was finally incorporated. So they started with very modest beginnings, like a lot of the tech companies starting in a garage, starting in some small venue, and then all of a sudden growing into a multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar company. Uh, that was kind of the, the wellspring of uh, how the White Sewing Machine Company came about, how they started to really grow things, um, you know, with vibrating shuttles and then eventually growing into uh, machines similar to the one you see in front of you. And... Um, their average production size was probably around 50 to 60,000 machines, so not huge. Nothing compared to the production size of Singers uh, in most cases when it comes to the different class machines they were using. So I'm just thumbing through and seeing if there's anything else I want to mention that's uh, significant. But, you know, the, the short skinny of it is it wasn't a company that started with deep pockets. And so they wanted everything to count. You can only imagine as they were building these machines, knowing that they had to sell that machine they were making in order to move on to the next stage of trying to grow that company, that they wanted to get it right. And as I, as I went through the pictures of, uh, this, you know, of this machine, as I go through the pictures of this machine on Facebook and show you kind of the innards of it and kind of what I took it through, um, at least parts of that, you're going to see exactly why I say they did it right. Um, the White Sewing Machine Company, the Domestic Sewing Machine Company, and others, they didn't try to go in above their neck. They tried to start with the basics in mind. We want to make the best machine we possibly can. We want it to last, and we want to really impress our customers so that they're going to, by word of mouth, tell others about what we're trying to do. So... Kudos to them. They did it right. All right, let me walk you around this machine a little bit. Just kind of point out some things that I think are unique. I also should mention uh, this little hat I have over here, which was part of the beautification for Japan. Um, not, in, not in the great past, but in recent years, they've really focused on environmental things, as a lot of companies have. They've really focused on making things uh, beautiful. And you'll notice at the bottom of this hat is a word that's kind of in an aqua blue. I'll try to zoom in on it. And the word is kaboto, kaboto, kaboto. I think I'm saying that right. Or kubuto, however you say it. When you translate that word, the translation is interesting to me. Because the, the literal meaning of that word is sunken rice patty I have no idea why so if you ever are on a trivial pursuit program and however they pronounce it whether they say kubuta or kabota the meaning is sunken rice patty there you have it you know the rest of the story as that great host on radio used to say so well okay Let's go around the machine. Obviously, down here on the far right, you've got a tensioner for winding a bobbin. And when you wind a bobbin on this machine, it's a little bit interesting. You come off the back of that spool pin on the back of the machine. Let me bring that lamp up a little bit. You come off the back of that spool pin on the rear. You come underneath the handle, just like when you're sewing. you got to go underneath the handle <laughs> and then when you're uh, when you're threading this machine or when you're winding a bobbin you have to feed it through one of these three eyelet holes the manual doesn't specifically say which one to use when you're winding a bobbin I would recommend 
the one at the very bottom. When you're sewing, you're going to use the one right in the middle. I tried using the upper eyelet. I tried using the lower eyelet when I was doing some test sew-offs. It causes the spool on the rear of the machine to do all kinds of funky things that are not good and are not conducive to sewing. So <laughs> you come off the back, go through that lower eyelet if you're winding a bobbin. You're going to drop all the way across the front of the machine. You're going to come through this tensioner and then you're going to come straight up to this wheel that is actually spring-loaded. So when you engage this uh, bobbin winder, you don't have to push it up and hold it. It launches and locks into that balance wheel so you can wind a bobbin. And obviously you're just going to put the bobbin on here and then it does disengage automatically uh, as a result of the settings on here when you're done winding a bobbin. And it does it does such a fast job of winding the bobbin, you know, fasten your seatbelt because you can wind a bobbin probably in about 30 to 40 seconds on this machine. It just races into it. So then just to the um, the left of here is our feed dog controller. And we've got three different settings potentially on here if I can get my camera to stand still. On the far right, you can see where I have it right now, is with the feed dogs at their highest position. If you're sewing something more delicate like satins and silks, you can rotate that knob to the low position so that those feed dogs don't dig in as hard. And if you're doing freehand embroidery, you can move that knob all the way to the left so that those feed dogs are totally dropped and they're not touching the material whatsoever. If we move up the front of the machine a little bit, you see right here they are really proud of the fact that this is a genuine zigzag machine and they want you to know that this controller on the bottom is for what? It's for stitch width. And they want to give you the option to, to do some settings kind of like you do on the Singer machines. So right here, this is spring loaded you push it, it's going to go right back to where it started. You want to set it, let's say, on two to do a zigzag. You then push in this little tab right here, and it locks it in place. If you want to resume straight stitching again, just push this little tab in, and it'll walk all the way back to zero automatically. Same thing on the upper boundaries over here. Let me just make sure you're seeing what I'm seeing, because I've got the screen turned around. Yeah, there we go. So if you want to set an upper boundary, just push this tab in, bring this over to here, and then you can't go any further than that point. It's a stop point. So you can set a stop point on the top. You could technically set a stop point on the bottom and leave this as your set range right here at about one and a half as far as uh, stitch width. So that's a neat little feature. And it works extremely well uh, they're not going to slip. They do lock in place when you set them. So a neat way to control um, project outcomes. We're moving up a little bit now to this controller. This controller is going to be for stitch length. And it's also going to give you access to reverse by just pushing that big white button in. The thing that's characteristic of post-World War II machines that came out of Japan is they always make that reverse button so evident. I don't think anyone could miss it. Not even Mr. Bean could miss it. Not even Lucille Ball could miss it <laughs> when it comes to, you know, the, the basics of sewing. And then if we move a little bit to the right over here, we've got a uh, control center for stitch output. In most instances, you're always going to be set on that M that's in kind of an orangey color. Uh, you've got the option to go to the left there to a blind hem. You've got a kind of a stretch style stitch a little bit further down. You've got a different but, a variety of different button holder settings as well if you want to use those. But for the majority of the sewing you're going to be doing, you're pretty much always going to be using that M as your set point. And then you can go between straight and zigzag stitching at that point there. So a very simple machine to use, not complicated at all. Uh, 
and just a gorgeous machine to you know spend hours sitting in front of uh, it really is and uh, so let me put on a little bit more Japanese style music and uh, we'll do a couple more sew offs on this machine uh, all I can say is if you're looking for a machine that you could take to a quilting retreat that you could take to a quilting type expo uh, set it up at your booth and just get people salivating kind of like that beautiful golden free Westinghouse it's just an eye grabber immediately as someone looks at it someone walks past a machine like this they're not going to be able to walk past it they're going to have to stop and ask you about the machine and ask you about your business and ask you you know all the particulars of uh, you know what the machine does etc uh, and Japanese engineering is just really hard to beat I just have to be honest with you when we gave them the US patents and designs and they were rebuilding their economy in the post-World War II era they poured everything into making those machines as good as they could possibly be you've seen that already in a couple of sew-offs so let me do something else before we go into another sew-off I'm, I'm just I know I'm a little bit scattered today <laughs> I know that let's look at some of the shots I took of this machine uh, as I was taking it through a process of getting it ready for sale and I haven't even mentioned have I I haven't even mentioned that this white model seven six four is for sale so if you're looking for a machine that has more than two times the power of a Singer 201-2, more than two times the power of a Singer 1591, more power than any Singer sewing machine in those classes ever made, more power than most of the FAF machines, more power than most of the Necky machines, most of those come in at about one amp or 1.1 amps this is a 1.3 amp motor uh, and having gone through the motor let me just tell you it is a beefy meaty motor that's ready to get the job done not to mention it's just a drop dead gorgeous machine I'm, I'm like a little kid in a candy shop I can't can't stop going back to that so here's just an opening shot kind of with uh, that accessory box I already showed you the two manuals the quick reference and the regular owner's manual here I'm going to be taking off the top of the uh, the machine uh, which is just held on by two bolts and the one one thing I can tell you is that this machine you'll you'll see yourself is just made for absolute it was it was made and born for heavy-duty sewing here's just a couple of oiling points a lot of oiling points on this machine and and those are covered in the uh, owner's manual as well here I've got the machine kind of uh, leaning back on my little pillow and I'm lubricating a number of the points on the bottom again you can see all steel all forged steel on this uh, Japanese uh, white machine here we're looking at the top of the machine uh, the main drive shaft coming off of the balance wheel all forged steel uh, absolutely made for the heaviest of heavy duty sewing again we're kind of moving across the top of the machine with the top taken off and you're looking down uh, into the machine um, everything within view there is all steel again they didn't cut any corners um, even as Singer had done with adding some plastic components uh, everything they had uh, is extremely well made and forged steel the main shaft is one of the largest main shafts uh, as far as ruggedness that I've seen in any machine recently on this workbench oh and I should mention in that last sh last shot and some of these will be on a sequence um, um, here you can see like a residue on there that's fresh grease that I just added um, to those uh, different joining points coming off of the main shaft
Here we're seeing kind of a long shot across it after it's all been cleaned, lubricated, uh, and greased. Also, there were some adjustments that had to be made on the machine as well. Here again, we're adding a special grease uh, to all those cam joining points and to those gear points as well. Another worm style gear that uh, is on the top of the machine. Again, everything that I could find was all steel. Uh, more lubrication points. Again, machines are, uh, are not maintenance heavy, but you do have to watch your lubrication points on any sewing machine, and uh, this Japanese white is no different. Here we're just removing some old grease and some old residue. As well here we've got some old grease that we don't want to leave on the machine. I'll come out on this shot a little bit. And with, with any machine you're always going to find dirt and grease and gook and yuck and you gotta get all that off for that for that machine to run as optimal as it can you gotta get rid of the old and put in the new this is a real cool little sticker on the front um, underside of the bed uh, that basically tells you that it was uh, as it came into our country it was evaluated. I'll try to zoom in on it so you can see it closer. But it was basically evaluated, inspected. Can you read that? It was evaluated, inspected in California. And uh, specifically, I think it says Los Angeles. I don't have my reading glasses on, so I am struggling a little bit, folks. <laughs> Let me see if I can cheat and get a closer look at that. Yep, so it says, Founded 1781, Department of Building and Safety, City of Los Angeles, approved for electrical safety. So that was their badge mark to basically say the machine was safe uh, to operate. They had evaluated all the electrical, etc. And there's another little plate that's underneath the edge of the machine. And as you can see, it says the machine is equipped with a lint cleaner and binding device. That's a fancy way of saying that the way the raceway is built, it has a little gadget, and I'll actually show you what it looks like. set it near the screen and you can take a close look. I'll kind of drop down to it real quick. It has a little gadget that is designed to go in the raceway. And it's designed to bind and to catch some of the junk that otherwise would be rolling around inside of the raceway and um, keep that raceway cleaner, keep the quality of the stitch there, keep the machine running efficiently. That is the design concept. But what I found is that it can also cause issues uh, with the thread movement in the raceway and can actually sometimes cause thread breaking as well, no matter how many ways you try to adjust it. So at least for now, and I'm going to provide it with the machine because it's part of the original uh, equipment, uh, but for our purposes of sew-offs and everything, I've taken it out of there because I was running into issues with it not seating in tight enough and then getting kind of a wiggliness to it and moving around while that thread was trying to move past it and creating problems. So this is again, you know, they're, they're real proud of their little sticker, but I've kind of undone it by taking that piece out because I was running into some problems with it not doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing. Back to the drawing board, folks. Back to the drawing board.
And now we've got the center plate that's just below the bed on the front of the machine. And here we're looking at the model number, model 764. And they're giving you the serial number as well. And they're saying, hey, if you ever have to, ever have to order parts, we want both numbers. But um, I'll be honest with you, unless you abuse or neglect this machine, I don't foresee you ever having to replace uh, any parts in the foreseeable future. And here again, you're just looking at a different angle of the front of the machine with the two manuals uh, displayed there. Here we're kind of looking down into um, the area where you would access the bobbin. If I widen my shot, we are. Really, really easy with this huge uh, uh, chromed plate on the front that just pops up. It's hinged and it's it's got a spring on it, so you just lift it up, it pops open easily. You can reach in, uh, change out thread. You can add more thread to the bobbin uh, if needed or put another bobbin in. Uh, you can clean out the raceway very easily as well by just ac accessing it uh, through this little portal and you don't have to lean the machine back like you do with some where it's just real tight in there. Here you've just got ample space. It's very, very easy uh, to service that point for any reason. So uh, really a nice design feature. Uh, Faceplate open here and you can see a nice bright light. Uh, the light puts out a lot of, uh, of brightness. You can see that kind of in the opening uh, part of the premiere where I opened just with that light on and it was really really quite bright even in total darkness. Um, so they've done a wonderful job in my opinion as far as um, the lighting setup on this machine. And here you're just kind of looking at the faceplate down uh, across the machine. Again every angle you come at this machine it's just gorgeous. It's just really a head turner. Here we're looking at the rear of the machine. Again, badge marked with uh, white as the manufacturer, uh, even though it was manufactured obviously in um, the beautiful country of Japan. And here on the back of the uh, machine is uh, um, a typical uh, nomenclature type plate. I'm going to really zoom in on it so you can see it close up and personal. Uh, Designed, engineered, and guaranteed by White Sewing Machine of Cleveland, Ohio slash Toronto, Canada. So we've got kind of a uh, tri-identity machine here. We've got a Japanese, we've got a Canadian, and we have a U.S. of A. Uh, machine as far as the different roots uh, of the machine. Uh, all of the pieces coming together, if you will, to make it complete. And then finally at the bottom you'll see 115 volts. 1.3 amp motor folks let me just say if you don't want a powerful machine don't even reach out about this machine because this is just a, a, a monster when it comes to having that grit uh, to go through heavy duty materials and yet the foot controller allows you to really harness that and really hold it back and control that power as well so it's not power without restraint it's power under control And here again, you're just looking at the rear of the machine, kind of the housed portion. Uh, this would give you access to the, the, uh, the drive belt on the inside, uh, the motor as well. Uh, very easy to access these different points for maintenance. Uh, even in the owner's manual, it shows you step by step. It shows you step by step how to change the belt on this machine if needed. I've already inspected the belt. The belt is good. I would say conservatively for five to ten years. Uh, I would say closer to the ten-year mark depending on the amount of sewing you do. And you can see on the rear of the machine, apart from the gorgeous shine of this museum quality machine, uh, you also have two spool pins so it also covers in the uh, owner's manual in detail how to potentially dual needle sew or twin needle sew uh, with this uh, uh, white Japanese model 764 as well. I mean it really it has everything. It's got the power, it's got the look, it's got uh, the versatility of the uh, various stitches you can choose from it. I mean it's just 
it, every every box for me would be checked. And here we're looking at the balance wheel across the machine. Um, again, every aspect of the machine just absolutely gorgeous. Here we're kind of looking at the front of it. Again, look at the look at the curves and the way they built that um, handle into the design of the machine, get, just giving it incredibly sexy lines. And the controls, again, as, as we went around the machine briefly, are so easy to access and so easy to figure out. There's nothing left to question. And yet, if you run into something, guess what? You've got the owner's manual and the quick reference guide as well uh, to get those questions answered for you. Here we're looking over by the tensioner uh, faceplate area. Beautiful machine. And more of a distance shot. I think we went full circle. Yeah. Yeah, we went full circle. So, what can I say? If you've been waiting and waiting and waiting and just saying, well, I'm going to wait until the right machine comes along. I want a machine that is going to have all the power that I could possibly want. I want power in reserve. Check. I want a machine that can do not just a straight stitch, but I want it to be able to do a zigzag, maybe a blind hem. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be using the buttonholes, but that would be nice too. Check. I want a machine that when I take it to a quilting retreat, a quilting expo and set up my booth, I want people just to drool as they come by and to stop and and for me to have the opportunity to tell them about what I'm making with that machine, tell them about the machine, tell them about my business, check. I, I want the controls on it to be real easy to figure out. I don't, I don't want it, you know, to have to struggle with saying, okay, what do I need to move in order to get it to do this or that? Check. You know what? It'd be really, I, I definitely need the feed dogs to be able to be dropped, but I'm going to be sewing more delicate materials too, satins, silks. Uh, I don't want those feed dogs to be ripping into the material. I, I'd really love to be able to have kind of a fine adjuster on that feed dog drop so that I could lower the feed dogs but still have some pull. Check. You know, if I have to switch out the thread or put in a new bobbin, or if I just want to clean out the raceway, I, I don't want to have to tilt the machine back. I want to be able to access that bobbin area very easily. Check. You know, if I, if I need to move this machine from one table to another in my sewing area, in my sewing room, or even when I'm out with the machine, or for bringing the machine into a venue, it'd be great to have a safe way of carrying it. Check. This machine is just, I mean, as I look at it, I don't know about you, but every single box that I would want to check is checked by this machine. Uh, it really is just phenomenal. So enough blah, 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 blah. Let me put on some more beautiful Japanese music and let's wrap up with just a couple more sew-offs. I almost should have picked out some Canadian music too, huh? dramatically zooming in. Doesn't that plate look beautiful too? I've got a little bit of remnants of the leather and stuff that have kind of fallen on it, but even that alone is a showpiece for this white 764. All right, let's do some more sewing. All right, what I'm gonna be doing now is full grain leather. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and fold this in half, and we're going to zip down uh, two layers of it. Actually, I'm going to move that over a little bit, I think. I turned my light off because I didn't want to just burn the, burn the ball while we were overlooking at the shots on Facebook. All right, so two layers of full grain leather. Let's see how this white 764 does with a task as difficult as this. Here we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> I, 
I thought, I'm going to give it a little bit more gas. Uh, wow, it kind of ran away, didn't it? <laughs> and look at the stitches. I've said it a million times. Getting through it is the first task, but generating a stitch that looks as absolute gorgeous as this, both the top stitch and the lock stitch, that's what it's all about. That's what we're looking to do. And look at it from the side. I haven't even clipped the threads yet. Let me turn this around. We're looking at probably around eight ounces of full grain leather. And I, if I remember correctly, this is protected full grain leather. So it's been treated to make it even more pierce resistant, even more durable. And like I said, I, I just gave it a little bit more gas than before. And it was like, brrr, done. So, <laughs> oh gosh. Like I said, more than two times the strength of a Singer 201-2, the Rolls Royce of Singers, that pretty much tells you this is a go-get-it machine. All right. I've got to do my U.S. Army grade canvas, right? So I'm going to fold it in half. We're up to two layers. Folding it again, we're up to four layers. I've got to kind of line these up a little bit. They're kind of goofy. So four layers. And then I'll go ahead and fold it one more time and we're up to eight layers of U.S. Army Grey canvas. And I'm going to show you a little trick uh, when it comes to getting something this thick underneath the presser foot, even though we don't have to. You can see I've got it underneath there and there's plenty of room. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and drop the presser foot and then I'm going to show you on top of the machine. And you've seen this before with other machines that I presented. Right up here, We've got a quick release where if we've got something super duper thick, in order to have that presser foot be able to move up and down freely, we just push this outer ring and I can move that presser foot up and down almost as far as from here to here to fit a real thick quilt or something else. And then once I get it in, into position underneath the uh, presser foot, with a single finger, I just push that back down and all that presser foot pressure is locked into place again ready to go back to sewing another way you could do it if you didn't want to mess with that is you could go over here and you could drop your feed dogs as well and then re-engage those feed dogs to get those thicker materials uh, underneath the uh, presser foot you know just a couple little sewing hacks so that you're not limited by the clearance on that uh, presser foot all right so eight layers of U.S. Army grade canvas. Here we go. I'm actually slowing it down a little bit just to show you you don't have to race. And there's our U.S. Army grade canvas. Eight layers. Absolutely breathtaking stitches from this Japanese engineered white 764. And the same thing is true of that lock stitch. You could literally take a picture of the lock stitch and the top stitch, and unlike a lot of machines where that top stitch is going to always outperform and outlook in appearance, that lock stitch, these are equal as it should be. And it just dawned on me, I haven't done any zigzagging so let me do that after I wipe off my beautiful chrome plate that gives you access to the uh, raceway and bobbins again you just pop it up and it's that easy well you can't really see it because of the camera shot right now see that and right down there is your bobbin and your raceway. Just really, really smart, very, very smart engineering every aspect of the machine. All right, let's do a little zigzagging. So off camera, what I'm doing right now is I'm moving our stitch length from six 
down to about three. And then I'm going to move my lever for a stitch width from a zero up to two. And then I'm going to lock it in place. And I don't want to leave you out of the anything that I'm doing. So I basically just took this and I moved it from zero to about two. And then I took our stitch length and I moved it from six uh, down to three. Again, this machine is just so easy to use, it's, it's really ridiculous. All right, so let's do a little zigzagging. I'll do it on this uh, extra piece of uh, genuine cowhide leather that I have. We'll kind of zigzag down, box it, and come back. And then that'll wrap up this premiere, I think. I probably should put on a little bit more Japanese music. Um, I just love, I love the sound of it. I don't know if you do. I certainly do. But let's pep it up a little bit, shall we? Dramatic, sad, dramatic, bright. Let's try this. I almost thought that said Finding Nemo, but it says Finding Movement. It says bright, so... Hopefully it'll pep up a little bit. All right. So here again is our 1.3 amp white model 764, sewing a single layer of genuine cowhide leather, about three ounces with a zigzag. Here we go. Absolutely gorgeous. It's a tiny little zigzag. I like the really the, the feel and look of that. It almost looks sculpted. And all we did was just box it, create a little box effect, uh, sewing down and around and coming back. Nothing fancy, but it really shows off the beauty of that zigzag nicely, doesn't it? And as we turn it over, or from all my extra thread, this is driving me nuts. <laughs> Alright, I gotta get rid of it. Sorry. That was a beautiful piece, wasn't it? Come on, you silly thing. There we got it. My clippers are definitely getting dull, getting very dull. So here you can see this is our, our top stitch again. Gorgeous, the stitch formation, the stitch uh, spacing, the, the stitch consistency um, as we boxed out this uh, genuine cowhide is just spot on. And the lock stitch is no different. Uh, when it comes to the um, lock stitch quality and the way it presents uh, through this leather, it's absolutely spot on. So again, just kind of revisiting the sew-offs that we've done, and I hate to cover this beautiful chrome plate, but we did the single layer of genuine cowhide. We did the two layers of uh, genuine elk uh, hide. We did the eight layers of U.S. Army grade canvas. You know, this is horrible. Let me lay these out because you can't even really see the stitches in that shot. The shot is kind of like all over the place. And I got to get rid of these threads too, or these going to dry. These are going to draw me bonkers. Yeah, I'll go like that. There we go. Here's our elk 
hide and we also did two other saws so I got to kind of sneak them in here somewhere maybe I can sneak them out front yeah I'll do that because I don't want to I don't want to cover up my beautiful plate I'm sorry So we basically did five sew-offs. And apart from the US Army grade canvas, we did all leather. Because really, when I look at a machine like this, it has more than two times the power of the Singer 201-2, which a lot of people will buy the 201-2 for leather sewing. But we're talking about a machine here that has more than two times that strength. And here you can see that protected full grain leather. Again, okay, it's thick. It's really tough leather to pierce. But look at the stitch that we laid down on it. And the lock stitch looks just as absolutely gorgeous. And then we did our two layers of genuine cowhide. Um, also, a stitch quality that is just absolutely drop your jaw open and go, what? It's just absolutely spectacular in every way. And if we move up towards the needle area, past my beautiful plate that I didn't want to cover, we've got our eight layers of uh, US Army grade canvas. You can kind of see it on the end there. And what else you can see is the stitch quality. I mean, the stitches are absolutely as good as they can get. I would put those up against any other machine in the world. Here we've got our two layers of genuine uh, elk hide. And again, those stitches are just absolutely spectacular in every way. We've got our uh, box little sew off here with our genuine cowhide with a zigzag, kind of a micro zigzag. And again, just absolutely spectacular in every way. So, all I can say is if you're, if you're looking for a machine that can do it all, if you're looking for a machine that has the power, the beauty, the grace, the, um, you know, the, the, the shock factor of beauty when uh, you put it out at a quilting uh, expo at a quilting retreat and you're wanting to attract uh, new customers and show your wares in that like I said every box that I could possibly want checked would be checked with this machine uh, it is for sale so I would encourage you to reach out uh, sooner than later uh, every machine that I put up so far uh, on average lasts about 72 hours some of them last less than seven hours you can already see what a, a head turner this machine is. You've already seen how it can sew, the quality of the sewing, and the ease of using a machine like this. Um, there's going to be a lot of interest. So if you want it, jump on it now. And I won't even require that you greet me in Japanese if you call me on my cell phone. But if you want to and just totally amaze me, when I answer the phone and I say, Hey, this is Scott. How can I help you? You can say... Konnichiwa. And I'll say back to you, Konnichiwa. And then you can say, Okengi deska. Okengi deska. How are you? And I'll say, I'm good. That's probably not Japanese. But at any rate, folks, this is an incredible museum quality machine. Not to mention a workhorse of workhorses. It is for sale. So reach out. Uh, I would recommend calling me on my direct line, which is 920-454-0393. You can even do it during this premiere to express your interest in the machine. And uh, we'll go ahead and take the next steps after that. Um, I want to just thank you for being faithful followers. I've seen really an, uh, a spike up as far as uh, people subscribing to the YouTube channel. I want to thank you for doing that because we have so many that come to the channel and so few that we can account for through being subscribers. So I really appreciate those of you that have taken that next step. And we are not too far away from our next major contest. And that's the only way you can be eligible to participate in it is if you are a subscriber of the YouTube channel and if you've liked the Facebook business page. And it's gonna be a really, really great contest. You don't wanna miss it. So take those steps, prepare for it, I think we're about 200 subscribers away 
from our next major contest when we hit 6,000 subscribers on the YouTube channel. I said it, 6,000. It's crazy. So God bless you guys. Stay tuned for more great premieres like this. I'll end in some Japanese music, right? Gotta do it. Gotta do it. And we'll come off the tripod.